Um, welcome to this webinar. We are very happy to have all of you uh, participating in this webinar. Uh, we're very excited about today. Uh, so this webinar is being organized by WACSI uh, in partnership with TechSoup. Uh, so the discussion today will be about how nonprofit leaders or civil society leaders can manage a remote workforce. So we're going to be talking about how we can effectively work from home or from out of the office environment. Now, for us to have a very smooth webinar uh, and a very uh, resourceful and fruitful webinar, uh, we would like to share a couple of ground rules. And we want to entreat that everyone uh, follows these ground rules as best as they can. So I would like to go through all the specific ground rules. So rule number one, please keep your microphone and camera on mute. So microphones and camera on mute, please. Number two, if you have any questions or comments, um, kindly submit, submit them in the chat section. So we have a chat section. And when you look at the bottom uh, of your screen, you see a chat section. Number three, if you lose your internet connection, reconnect using the link um, that we had emailed to you. So reconnect using the same link. You will be given access. And number four, you'll receive an email with the recording and all the useful resources. So just to let you know, we'll be recording this and all the additional resources will be sent to everyone who participated in this webinar. So just to go over the ground rules again, very quickly. Let's keep all our microphones and cameras on mute. If you have any questions or comments, kindly submit them in the chat sections. Uh, if you lose your connection, which is something that happens a lot, in our environment, we should reconnect uh, using the same link, reconnect using the same link emailed uh, to you. And then you will receive an email of the recorded version of this webinar and other resources um, that you will find useful. So these are our, our ground rules. So please, because we are quite a large number of people, we will not do a physical, like face-to-face -face introduction. So we'd like to encourage everyone to state their names and their organizations and where they are coming from <clears throat> or where they are located in the chat section. I've seen that uh, colleagues have already started to do that and we'd like to thank you for that. My colleagues uh, uh, who are managing the chat section will also be interacting with you as we proceed. So at this juncture, I'd like to um, call my colleague Stella, um, I believe, yes, Stella is online, for us to give us a background uh, or the reason why we are organizing this webinar. Stella? Thank you very much, Charles. And I wish to thank colleagues who have joined us in this webinar today. Thank you. That's every time you receive our invitation, you you make it a point to register and and join us we wish to thank you so much for that so as we all know the covid 19 pandemic has really disrupted the way we work and in our part of the world where nonprofit leaders are already struggling to effectively manage their employees due to limited funding the covid 19 pandemic has just made it harder we are witnessing organizations who have temporarily stopped operating hoping for the situation to be contained. Some have continued the operations, but were forced to lay off some of their employees. And we, we, we all bear with me that this has really made uh, many people lose their jobs and probably they hope to find a new one soon as the situation is going from bad to worse every single day. So to encourage CSOs to embrace this new normal, Waxi since April have been organizing series of webinars on remote working for non-profit organizations. So far under this series, two webinars have been organized and some of you have actually joined and participated in that webinar. So the first one 
on how can nonprofit organizations succeed in the digital workspace, we discuss available tools nonprofit can use to enhance their collaboration even working from home. The second one was themed how can nonprofit organizations manage a secure digital workspace. And in that webinar, we discussed the different attacks nonprofits can be prone to while working from home and how they can be safe. We have all those, we have those two webinars available on YouTube. The links will be sent to you in the chat box if you, have, you didn't have the opportunity to participate to follow at your own pace as it is recorded. So today's webinar, as my colleague Charles has already mentioned, is on how nonprofit leaders can manage a remote workforce. The goal of this webinar is to understand some of the most important decisions nonprofit executives have to make and draw key lessons on how they have been able to cope amid caring for employees and maintaining organizational operations to help their various organizations in this pandemic period improve their response and resilience. We hope you enjoy this session. And as my colleague already said, in this part of the world, we have internet connection problems. So if you, you go off the call, just join back using the link and you follow the discussion. Thank you so much. Charles, kindly take the floor. Thank you so much, Stella, for that background. Thank you very, very much appreciated. So today we, we are blessed to have uh, two colleagues of ours who are executive leaders in their organizations who will be sharing their experiences. And I'd like to introduce uh, these two colleagues. Uh, so today we're going to have a conversation with the executive director of the West Africa Civil Society Institute, Nana Afajanu. Um, and also the executive director of the Nigeria Network of NGOs, OEBC Olu Sheyi. And uh, being a, a Nigerian affiliate, I hope I pronounced your name well. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's really, we are really excited to host both Nana and OEBC, who have extensive experience working within the civil society sector in the region and, and, and beyond. And they'll be sharing with us today uh, some of their insights in terms of how they've been able to navigate their organization through this very um, disruptive period that we are going through right now. And so the way the conversation is going to go is we're going to be looking at various aspects of, of leadership within this disruptive uh, time, looking at especially how uh, they've been able to help their staff and teams and to work remotely and the, set, and the things that they've been able to put in place to ensure that staff are working effectively. We're also going to be looking at whether, you know, working remotely uh, presents certain opportunities. And of course, we'll also be looking at lessons learned and of course the way forward. So I'll just get into it right away. Uh, uh, by, you know, focusing first of all on the readiness aspect and because this is an aspect that has, you know, been very conversational throughout this COVID-19 experience. Were we ready uh, f f uh, to work uh, remotely? So I'll, I'll start with, um, with OEBC uh, from NNGO and, and, the, and the question is, so during the restrictions and, and during the, the lockdown, uh, were your staff uh, working uh, remotely and how were they able to embrace, if they were, how were they able to embrace working remotely? Yes, thank you very much, Charles, for the opportunity to be able to share my experience this morning. And it's um, a pleasure to be sharing time and space with um, my sister, Nana, whom I so much uh, have a lot of respect for. And having said that, it's good to also tell you that um, the decision to start working from home actually started with one of my colleagues giving me feedback on why they should now start working from home. So I didn't want to take that decision like immediately, even though government was saying, yeah, you guys would have to work from home. So I just walked into the office and uh, 
my comms colleague came to me and said, Edi, we have to, that was how he, she called my name. That I said, Edi, we have to find a way of uh, ensuring that we work from home because the situation is getting worse. Uh, before that, it wasn't worse, actually. It was just like, uh, we just uh, got the first index case around that period. So I'm like, okay, so let's discuss about it. So call and we're talking, we're talking, we're all going back and forth. I just said, all right, tomorrow, all of you just work from home. So, this is for all at ad hoc. Uh, I remember one of my colleagues working from home from uh, one of our offices outside of um, uh, the headquarters, and she's been working for like years. Uh, for myself, I've always been a big fan of working from home since I joined the sector, and I've done most of my work from, uh, from home, the majority of my life in the sector. So working from home is not something that is new to So It was very easy for me to quickly make that decision and to communicate that decision to the board that this is what uh, decision I've taken. Over to you, Charles. Thank you, UBC. Uh, so Nana, was, for you, was working from home something that you were used to? Or did it come as kind of a shock for you in terms of that transition? We'd like to know how you felt working from home. <laughs> well, um, for, for, for me, personally, um, I was not used to necessarily working from home. I mean, most of the time, it was the office. Working um, from home or working remotely mostly meant that we were either out of the office, you are traveled out of the office, um, but not necessarily working from your home and stuck in the four corners um, of your house. So that is, that is where the difference was. Um, but for us, we as an um, organization took the decision to start working from home um, even before the government of Ghana announced their lockdown. We took the decision one week before. Um, and we did it, I mean, management had a discussion about what was coming uh, because we could actually see it coming and what we needed to do as an institution. And together we had a conversation with all staff and all of us decided that it would be good at least to work from home for some time and discuss some of the things that we needed to do to help us work from home. So um, in a sense, I think that for, for Waxi, we, we kind of thought a bit ahead um, before um, this, this happened. And, and that is how, that is how we, 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 we went ahead to do it. All right, thank you, Nana. So let's just delve a bit deeper into the actual uh, remote working experience itself, know, because you know, the eyes, the a lot of the times people say that you know when you're working in a dispersed way it, it hampers well, collaboration well, it hampers well, communication so back to you or UBC how do you keep your team together um, since you have that experience of working from how do you, how do you keep your team together in terms of communication team dynamics to ensure that they still deliver uh, when they are dispersed and not in one in one building. So I think for me the first thing was to empathize uh, to understand that um, while they are working within the network, they would also be um, affected by COVID itself, uh, given the realities that we're seeing. Uh, but I was also sure that I could meet all my deliverables and my reporting uh, timelines. So what I did was uh, to ensure that at least we meet twice a week and um, the meetings were meant to one check as to what the plans are for the week and I witnessed a check where uh, uh, what uh, progress colleagues are making. And I also took it upon myself to ensure that I check with them at the personal level to be sure that I know how they're faring and how they're coping with um, uh, the the pandemic itself. Uh, the other part is to also ensure that they had they, can, they could go home with their laptops and that we could ensure that as much as possible we stay on top of what each other is doing. So every morning they clock in using a clocking app that helps me ensure that at least they've clocked in and uh, they also when closed they also closed. 
Uh, but there's a part where I also have to trust them uh, when they don't also clock in. I, I can I totally understand. What matters during that period is the fact that they're able to meet the deliverables. Mm -hmm. And you know, while I was reflecting on some of these, um, uh, my responses today, I had to call them all to say, so what worked for us? What did we do different? <laughs> what was this that made sense? And they were telling me how you know uh, I was a bit flexible in terms of them meeting. Uh, their deliverables and how I was able to connect with them because I, I knew they would be listening to me so I also didn't want to say what would get me into trouble with them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I checked and, and they were the ones that gave me the feedback as to what actually worked. Um, I also ensured that they completed their, their, their time sheets uh, because I do know that donors would not they really pay attention to when I give excuses that uh, XYZ was because of COVID. So we ensure that the time sheets were all completed and that, you know, we delivered based on uh, the new work plans we had to do uh, based on the pandemic that we're seeing. But it, it, uh, important lessons that I could learn from there is the fact that I, you know, I had to empathize. Uh, one is the fact that uh, we also had to do palliative for staff, uh, even though uh, we didn't have resources, but we had to ensure that they buy. And so one of them was telling me that after receiving the palliative, she had to say to herself, if I don't meet my deliverables, then I'm in trouble. Over to you, Charles. <laughs> Thank you so much, Oyibis. Very interesting. So, Nana, did you have a similar experience to, uh, was there something else that uh, you, you also kind of advocated for to be done to ensure yes. team cohesion? Yes. yes. Um, a number of things that Oyibis has touched on. Definitely the planning is very important. So one of the things we did when we decided as, a, as an organization to, to start working from home was to do some scenario planning. So we had a short term, medium term and long term plan for if we are going to have COVID, how are we going to continue our operations and remain effective and meet the targets that the people we work with and expect us to, to, to deliver on and the people for whom we have been set up that we are able to deliver the services and everything so we did this kind of work and planning and then we also because we had already started doing some investment in technology before this this happened so there was a need for us to then update our skills in specific um, the use of specific software and technology that would enable that team cohesion so teams SharePoint, Google Docs, um, all of those things, and Zoom and how to make sure that we are able to use all of that we, we, to enable our productivity. We, we, we worked on that and, and updated our skills on that. Um, we also supported staff with data because we knew that this, we would definitely need a lot more data to do our work. There is so possible, we, there is possible. We, 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 we did uh, uh, support staff with data. And then we, of course, in the planning, we had to make sure that how do we make sure that we follow with, through with the plan. So we have team meetings, we have our staff meetings, which we, we do. And then even more important is the staff welfare. So connecting with each other and making sure that we are fine. Admin in particular, human resources, following up on staff. And then we have a WhatsApp platform um, as an organization. And on that WhatsApp platform, we discuss work, but we also discuss everything else. So it's not only just work, it's jokes, it's politics, it's everything. And, and, and just so that we connect as an institution. And, um, and there's no ED there, there's no manager there, there's no everybody. Um, you know, contributes what, when they want and, and, and what they want once. It's something that, of course, um, all of us can associate with. So that's, that's, that is how we have kept, we have kept, kept things going. Thank you so much, Nana, and thank you for ABC. Uh, I mean, the discussion has been very interesting and some are just making me laugh here. Um, <laughs> I think the next question, I will ask that directly to Nana because uh, OABC has been starting for one now. So uh, we would like to know what are some of the activities you have planned to uh, implement this year, which you couldn't, 
and have planned new activities as a result of the COVID-19? Well, you know that uh, WAXI, one of the things that we do, particularly within our capacity development work stream, is the trainings and the face-to-face -face physical trainings. And where you have a, a situation where we have to do social distancing um, and, and you cannot meet people physically and there are lockdowns and you cannot travel. Um, all of those things have affected the, particularly our trainings um, because um, many of them are quite interactive. So we had to change that. Um, some of them have been postponed, those that can be postponed. Some of them have been converted um, to online trainings. We do miss something there, and I must admit, but it's still effective. Um, and, and those that have been part of it have given feedback to say that they, they have enjoyed it. Um, so those are some of the things that we have done. We have actually for one of our programs, um, which is the policy dialogues, we've had even more policy dialogues. One of the challenges we had with, with our policy dialogues was trying to get everybody, the travel, the costs, and all of that. And COVID has removed all of those challenges. And so we are able to engage um, people to discuss key policy issues um, from their different uh, locations. And that, has, that is one of the positives um, that has come out of it. So we've had many more policy dialogues. And we have also been working on COVID in particular. There are particular areas that we have been working on in relation to COVID, civil society's engagement. And so there are partners and new collaborations that have come up out of that, um, the need to respond to the issues at this time. So yeah, that is how, that is how uh, we, we, have, we have gone. One of the other good things I should say is that we have been able to reach for the first time our Lusophone um, colleagues. We have had several programs because of challenges with costs. It has been very difficult to reach uh, our Portuguese speaking um, colleagues. For the first time, we've been able to run a training program and that they have benefited from, and we are able to reach, reach them um, with some of the activities. So they have, they, we've had the, the good parts and the bad parts, but I think that there have been many opportunities that have come up as well. Thank you so much, Nana. Uh, we'd like to encourage colleagues to, who are on the call to also put their questions in the chat box, and we'll be glad to read them out. So um, I would like to ask the same question to Mr. ABC, if they also have the same issue like Waxi had, if they have to stop some of their, their program to uh, roll out new ones. And after you respond to that question, we have a question from a participant for you. So after you respond to that, we'll ask you that question. Thank you. Yes, just like every other organization, our activities were also affected. We run workshops and we also have a larger convening uh, that happens annually, uh, which is our annual conference. Uh, and, you know, we've received funding for us to be able to do a lot of workshop, workshops across the region. Uh, so that was and continues to be affected. And we've only just tried to say to ourselves that uh, because things are easing off now, we will now have to also do it based on the number of gatherings allowed per state where we're having this event, then find a way of connecting other participants via uh, the online platform. So it, it has actually disrupted a lot of our activities from uh, the physical gatherings we do have. Also taking this further to how we also uh, pass knowledge where we are invited as resource persons or as facilitators to come and help, you know, galvanize organizations or you know, provide mentoring and also coaching for organizations itself. Um, so, and we've now had to retool within all of that to say, Yes, even if we're going to do this event physically, we have to ensure that we follow all the measures. And in following all the measures, we also have to weigh it. Um, if we're going to have online activities, can we also contribute towards the cost of data 
for participants that will be attending our events. All of these things we're thinking through now. And if staff would have to travel, uh, before now, some donors will tell you that uh, you can all do ride sharing, but you can't do ride sharing anymore. So it means that if three of us or four of us are traveling, we won't do ride sharing, we'll go in different places. So all of these have implications for, uh, for one way them create that one with members, but also provide some level of policy for ourselves also that can help us also now negotiate better with donors and say because of xyz protocol uh, we can't do this anymore and we would need, now need to propose action for this so we're seeing the disruptions and now we have to find a way of planning within those disruptions from some of the uh, and events I've gone into, I'm told that the normal isn't the best for us. So maybe this is a good time for us to reset. Um, over to you. Thank you so much. A participant wants uh, Julia from Julia. Uh, she would like to know, uh, you mentioned that you have been having a meeting twice a week. So she would like to clarify whether those meetings are on site or on Zoom and how many if it's on site, how many people are allowed to be part of those meetings? And if it's, did these meetings take place after Nigeria government declare stay home or in other restrictions? She would like to know if it's on site, if those happened before. Okay, actually the, the meeting is actually online uh, and we'll be using Zoom. Uh, so the meeting started immediately. I that is the decision to say from our offices in two years, uh, the government impacted the sit down at home uh, order. Maybe a week or two weeks before the government started the sit at home order. Uh, but what I've also ensured is that I um, also let you run with me. So I'm not there. Uh, I let the meeting come because. Uh, I've had the way of doing their own meeting and the first Hello? I'm still busy. So we, we can hardly also, hear you. Your internet is breaking, please. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, it's better now. Thank you. Hello, I think we have lost him. Okay. Okay, so I think uh, we'll just move to the second. I mean, I'll give the floor to Charles to continue with Nana. So we have Mr. ABC back. All right, thank you. Thank you, Stella. Um, so Nana, the, uh, there's a question I would like to ask. There's also a question from one of the participants I think is very important. But it's, fo it's more focused on the challenges, and you've mentioned some of them. And one of the major challenges that people mention is about, uh, of course, communication, infrastructure, access to the internet. Um, so uh, what are your perspectives on this, and what are the other challenges that, you know, practically that you have seen with working uh, remotely? Thank you, Charles. Um, yes, the data issue. Um, accessibility, um, I mean, because we gave um, the data support, there was access to data. Affordability, to some extent, because we did give data, but there are some networks that are more expensive than others. And so we had to find a way, people had to find networks that were cheaper. And those were some of the things that uh, was difficult. And then of course, depending where the, on where the person is living, connectivity was an issue. So you realize that for some people, because in their area they have better network, it works better, they can engage a lot more. For others, it's more challenging. So we've had to use a combination of things. And WhatsApp, the WhatsApp platform, and connecting on WhatsApp has also been useful um, for other colleagues. Um, I talked about the fact that other challenge with our programs. So the interactive 
uh, activities, the ones where we really needed physical face-to-face -face have been affected. And we've had to look at some of them, those that we can, converting them into online activities. Now, I can give an example of our internships, for example, our young leadership, uh, next generation leadership internship is one of our flagship programs. You have interns come in, work, work uh, with WAXI for a number of months and work with other organizations at least for one month before they go back um, to their countries. And because of this, they were unable to have that face-to-face -face engagement with other organizations or even to finish um, what they had uh, with us here. We had to do it online. So you lose something from that, that physical engagement. Um, you lose something from that. And the other challenge for organizations like Waxi that have, we are a mixture of different people from different countries in West Africa. They're, not all of us are Ghanaians. And so there are non Ghanaians here. Um, staying at home, particularly during the lockdown period, where there's no family, many of them are living alone, um, it, it was challenging. So we had to find a way of making sure that we kept that connection, people to people connection through phone calls and through, 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 through looking at how we, we could engage. And then there are staff who had planned um, to go on leave, travel out to go to their families, they cannot because their borders are closed. So those are some of the practical challenges um, that, that we have had to face. And it's a human um, problem and that we, we have to try and make sure that um, we address. Of course, the other areas with, with working, when you are working with colleagues, you are working during lockdown. Um, it's this, what I'm going to say now, it should be for both men and women, but it's more for women when you are working at home and you have children who are also not going to school and so they are at home, you have to take care of the children, you have to take care of the home in addition to doing your work. Um, that creates some challenges with time. And so it's not like being in the office and doing your work and, and, and producing what it is. So as a leader or as leaders, one of the things that is extremely important, and OABC talked about it earlier, or two things. One is trust. You must trust the team <laughs> to deliver. And, and the other is flexibility. So you are looking at what are the goals, what are the things that we have agreed on to deliver, um, and then make sure that we all know what the, what the plan is, but the how, to deliver, you would have to leave it sometimes to the staff because you don't, the situation at home might be such that it's not the same as being in the office. So they would have to work. Some people may have to get up at night to work, maybe during the day to be challenging, but they can do it at night. So that, that has to be taken into consideration. There's some flexibility has to be put um, into the mix. So yeah, that, that, that is what I would say. It, it, it All right. Thank you so much, Nana. So there's a question from Lewis, which I think is a very important question. And I'll just read what she says. And I, I, I'm hoping that both you and OEBC can respond. So she says that WAXI and NNGO are well-established organizations with fairly adequate resources. So what advice would you give to smaller, less resourced NGOs and community-based organizations who are providing healthcare, education in vo to vulnerable groups in, these, in disadvantaged communities who don't have that kind of supportive infrastructure like computers or smartphones. You know, how do these people work from home? So, it, I mean, it, basically, what is the, is this a real limitation and how do they overcome it? Maybe it, Nana, is, you can start. it is a very, very real limitation, without doubt, because to some extent, there is nothing you can do if you are under lockdown and you do not have the tools that enable you to connect virtually. Um, so that is a real challenge that um, organizations that do not have that uh, face one of the tools though, I mean, if you look at the pen, our mobile uh, technology penetration, 
is, is very high in many of our countries. People have two or three phones. It may not necessarily be smartphones, but people have phones. So connecting with phones is one of the ways um, that, that you can continue to engage. It will definitely not be as effective as if you were meeting people face to face um, and engaging in, you know, in the communal way that you are, we are able to work and, and be effective. It's not going to be the same, but under the circumstances, you use what you have. So using uh, mobile technology, um, and if, if you, have, you are able to have a smartphone, then of course WhatsApp is very effective. You can actually have meetings um, on WhatsApp. Um, so those are some of the things that you can then um, use. But I think there's a larger issue that as civil society organizations, I mean, Waxi has been talking about this for a while, but I think that many, many more of us will have to advocate a lot more, is looking at how we close this digital divide. Because we are in the 21st century and technology drives most of the things that we do. So if we want to look at how to move forward and be more efficient and effective as organizations, we have to advocate so that our countries make it possible for many more people to have access to the kind of technology that they need to be efficient and effective and productive in their work. So that's a larger policy infrastructure issue that I think that civil society organizations have to take up um, post-COVID. If we can even start now, but definitely post-COVID, we definitely need to, to, to do better when it comes to that. All right. Thank you, Nana. Um, OEBC, what are your thoughts for um, the smaller NGOs? They're very much concerned about their survival and effectiveness. Um, so, um, Lois, I... The Nigerian network is you to see my cup might make it look like we're rich. But on a lighter note, that's on a lighter note, on a serious note, uh, I think what happened is when I inherited, inherited the network, uh, I inherited a network that was like your ordinary uh, small NGO without computers. The right stuff to work. You know, because of the investments we made or made at that time. So I, I do understand that we would have to invest in laptops rather than desktops. I understood the need for us to be able to work independently and also collaboratively. So we built an infrastructure that helped us to be, to be able to stay resilient uh, when we had an issue. We, we weren't expect, expecting a pandemic, but thinking back in, re in retrospect now, the investments we made while we were poor helped us to ensure that when we had a very difficult situation, we could easily say, yes, let's go do, let's do remote, uh, remote work. Uh, majority of the, of the systems that we used back then were, were bought at second user because that's what we could afford then. Uh, and when the resources started becoming more better, we invested in new, in new laptops and higher, higher, higher specifications also. So I do think there's a lesson that can be learned there, which would be uh, COVID has provided you um, an opportunity for, for you to look at the kind of investments you now have to make as an organization. Uh, so if you have the option of getting a laptop or a desktop, you definitely know you have to go for a desktop now. Uh, if you have the option of getting maybe a broadband or a home internet services, you already know which one to get just in case we have any other disruptive activity uh, that might happen. Uh, so I do know also getting resources to buy such uh, infrastructures are also not there. And that's why I'm, I'm also now sinking my thoughts with that of uh, Nana to say, yes, these are conversations that we now need uh, to, to start, especially looking at how we can talk to technology companies like uh, Dell, like uh, Panasonic, like HP, producers of laptops, what can they do for the sector so that the sector can bounce back and stay resilient? Uh, how can we also, you know, 
ensure that we are able to 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 stand when the next pandemic happens. Uh, so these are conversations that we would like to get engaged in, and I'm glad that uh, Nana uh, shared that thought. And I'm sure we would we would have to take that forward. Uh, uh, it's important we take it forward, and it's imp important that we look out for the smaller nonprofits uh, and also the medium-sized ones, because these are the guys that are actually in communities and in the field, and we want to stay connected to them and ensure that they can deliver uh, the dividends of democracy or development to the doors of the common man. Over to you, Charles. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Charles, let me just mention one thing before I forget, because I think it's an opportunity also to let people know that when it comes to software, um, we actually have cheaper software for civil society organizations. And it doesn't matter whether you are a big one or a small one. Once you are able to show that you are a credible non-governmental organization or non-profit organization, you can have access to this cheaper software through TechSoup. So I think that um, perhaps if we could share the link for those who, who may need um, this kind of, of, of support, and it doesn't matter, as I said, whether you're a big or small institution, it is for civil society organizations. Once you can prove that you are a legitimate one, you can get access to that. So that is one of the things. I mean, OABC talked about the hardware, there's also and that exists now, the software, cheaper software for civil society organizations. So we can't take advantage of that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nana, and thank you, ABC. Um, we'd like to assure colleagues on the call that your questions are not lost. We have track of all of them and we'll ask them in due time. So um, Samira would like to know how both leaders, Nana and ABC, were able to execute projects during this period remotely. Maybe OABC can take that first. Thank you. Yes, uh, to execute projects, uh, we have to look at which projects can we execute within a pandemic. And in all fairness to you, the options were just zero. There's none we could have implemented within a pandemic. Uh, so that then means that we have to negotiate with our donors. Uh, so rather than waiting for the donors to send us an email to ask questions, we started that conversation immediately to say, this is the impact of COVID on XYZ part component of our work. We would now need two things, it, 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 either to reschedule or to seek an extension for those that are due uh, during the pandemic or as the pandemic uh, advances. Uh, so we could actually do very little. Much of what we did while uh, we were under lockdown or other measures and protocols was to start providing support uh, to our members and to also start looking for private sector organizations who would need our members to distribute palliatives. Plus also using that to understand the impact of COVID-19 on our beneficiaries. And we did also advise our members, telling them that this is a good time for you to check with your beneficiaries and your stakeholders asking what has changed, I can begin to use that for your programming. So within the period where we were tough in the fight against COVID-19, we were learning lessons on the impact, also providing advisories to our members on our best to cope. In terms of project implementation, project implementation stopped 100%. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you so much. Nana, please, we'd like to take yeah, that. Yeah. Yes. Um, for us, we had to look at one, I mean, looking because we had our, our work plan and what it is that we had planned to do when. So we had to look at it to say, which of these projects or programs can we still go ahead and implement? And there were some of them, like our research knowledge curation um, projects which could go on because a lot of the work was online, communication was online and all of that. So that was, that was fine and those went ahead. Then we had to say, which ones can we convert from offline to online? And that was like the policy dialogues. And a number of them, we even got more of them um, this time around. And then we had to say, which ones, what new programs, would be relevant for civil society organizations at this time. What do they need and how can WAXI respond to that need? 
So that's where the new, um, some of the new programs um, came up and that we went with. So that's how we, we, we juggled um, this one. And of yeah, course, I mean, like I mean, as OABC said, yeah, as OABC said, you had to engage donor organizations, funders, technical partners, financial partners, and other, other partners that you were working with to have this conversation to say, to look at how we could do things differently. So, yeah. yeah I'm sorry, Nana. just to add to that, uh, mm -hmm. another thing we did, and just like Nana said, I'm just remembering now, is that the elements of our work that do not require physical, uh, what's it called, physical engagement continued as part of a project. For instance, where we needed to do a website or to do desk research for an activity, all of those continued, all of those continued. Activities do not require or human connection. Where the activities colleagues were working from. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, after this question from the chat, we will continue with the section as, as it was planned. But if your question is in the chat, it hasn't been forgotten, we'll come back to it. So this question is specifically directed to Nana. But if Nana is done responding, if Mr. ABC has something to add, he can add to it. And I'll give the floor to Charles to continue with the session. So from Eva Ankara, she would like to know whether the online training you have been conducting have been impactful to your beneficiaries. If yes, how do you assess the impact? Well, I mean, the feedback that we got is that it has been impactful. Um, for us as an institution, we miss the, the fun part, if I should say, because, you know, a lot of the interactive um, methodologies. Um, it has a it adds a different flavor to training. And online, you you may not get the same thing. However, what it has also taught us is that as an institution, we have to learn new skills. So, in terms of going forward, and and I know we are going to come to how do we move forward. One of the things that we are going to do, or we've already started doing as an institution, is looking at how we can make our online trainings. It is impactful. So far, that's what those who have participated tell us. But we think it could be even more impactful if we are able to learn more online facilitation skills as an institution. So those are, that is where, what, one of the things that Waxi does. We do build capacity but we are ourselves a continuously learning organization. So we will be training ourselves so that we can even get better at facilitating online, um, which is something that we have not invested a lot in in the past, even though we do it, but we believe that there's a lot more that we could learn. Um, now that a lot is going to go online, we, we want to even get better there so yeah eva it's been impactful from what we have heard from those who benefited but we think that even more can be done and we are going to make sure that we put ourselves in the position to make that happen thank you nana um OUBC, have you had the same experience in terms of your workshops that you've done online uh, OUBC, you are muted please <laughs> yes uh, 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 yeah basically we haven't explored doing any major workshop online what what we've done really is that is like an informal engagement with members online where we're just asking them are you fearing how are you coping and all of that because we've also seen a trend of many organizations now doing online trainings online workshops and all of those things rather than invest our resources in that area we supported those by you know, many would invite me to speak on NGOs and all that. So we, we, we kept accepting those invitations and we were inviting our members to attend because, you know, that way they could also access some of the information that needed, they need to uh, be able to get. But what we've done differently now is that uh, when we asked them for what we can do to help them, they all sent through a survey. They all told us what they wanted us to do. So we're addressing that individually as organizations. And I think we have about 300 responses already. 
and they've all told us what they wanted. Uh, so we're addressing each need per organization based on uh, what we can do, what we can't do, where can we, who, which organization can we talk to and all of those things. Uh, we do hope that uh, maybe in another two, three weeks, we would have an executive director's hangout. Uh, my thinking around that hangout will, that will, be, that, will be that it will be informal, uh, maybe also get some music, we dance at first, uh, then we now face the reality of what it means to lead this time. Then we have conversations like we're having now with uh, uh, the audience on this on this call. So for us, we've we, um, tried to look at how best can we invest our time and resources. And what we've done is to jump at all invitations that has come our way to speak about non-profits and all of that. And we share that with our members. So uh, rather than putting our energies on the planning for such, such events, we've put that on that organization that is hosting. We just come with the resources and uh, the lessons we've learned. And we do, then we are now using that helping individual organizations. What do you, Charles? Uh, thank you, UBC. I, I was smiling when you mentioned the Hangout, and I'm hoping you'll extend it to senior managers. Anyway, <laughs> so, but it's a good, it's a good thing because it speaks to the health of, 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 of staff. And I think there's an important question before we move on to the next session for Momolara about health. And it's a dimension that sometimes is overlooked. Um, so maybe you can share your experience as, as executive directors in terms of what, what you have been doing to, to kind of uh, respond to the health challenges of, of your staff working remotely, sitting down long hours, you know, depression from the pandemic, uh, you know, and other psychosocial challenges that they may be having. If you can provide some insights onto this, it would be very helpful. Maybe we'll start with uh, Nana. Thank you, Charles. Um, one, of the th one of the things for us, it is our people that make up the organization. Without waxy staff, there is no waxy. So it is extremely important. And um, something that we, one, one I've already talked about is the WhatsApp, which is like a free space for us. We talk about work, but there are other things that we also discuss. And the other thing is when we had the lockdown and there was kind of a free space, um, one thing we did was just to come to the office. And, and I know that it has its pros and cons, but we thought that at least before we, we take a, another decision on what to do, let's see each other face to face because we had been meeting for, I think we were on lockdown. We started before the government came in. So we were on lockdown for over six weeks. Um, and, and particularly for our colleagues who were not Ghanaians and so did not have people at home that they could talk to, we thought that it was very important to at least see each other. So we came to the office with our masks, did our social distancing and everything, but actually saw each other. Um, and just for the therapeutic part of it, you know, so that you, there's another human being that you're actually seeing. Um, so that, that was one of the things that we did. The other thing, of course, is the health and what is available. And so we do have a health, we do have health insurance for staff. Um, and of course, our HR and what it is, I mean, I have spoken to one or two staff about how particularly with COVID, some of the things that could be done um, to support if there's anything that you feel you are concerned about or all of that. And then harping on all of us, making sure that we observe the prevention protocols and keep ourselves safe. So the, the, one of the uh, decisions we took after that initial coming together was that we would rotate coming to the office and to every team, there's a, a rotation that we do have this rotational plan where people come to the office. This, this group will be here at a certain point. Another group will come next time. Um, and now we've taken another decision looking at how Ghana, Ghana's um, COVID cases are increasing. And because a lot of our staff actually use public transport to commute. And we think that because of the rate of community spread, it might be quite dangerous. We have taken another decision 
to work, uh, to look at remote working until it's extremely important for you to come to the office. You can work from home. Just make sure that the work is done. Um, and so that is how, those, that's, those are some of the things, putting the people first and, and making sure that everybody is healthy and, 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 and all right. Uh, thank you, Nana. OUBC, we would like to hear some of your, your insights about health issues related to, to your to staff. Okay, um, so the conversation has centered so much on how we are helping staff, but not, nobody is always helping the executive director. All right, so the first thing I did was to think about <laughs> how would I want to be treated? <laughs> All right, excellent, excellent. Yeah, even, I mean, nobody's taking care of us. We all just start doing the work and we're just, uh, we're just surviving. So when they tell you it's lonely at the top, they, they do know what they are saying. Um, but, you know, what, what I've done is that flexibility. So usually, uh, pre the pandemic, you cannot tell me you've missed my deadline. No, no, you can't miss my deadline, you know. But immediately there's a pandemic, I understand that, uh, you know, for those that are married, children, for those that are single, they probably will be distracted and all of those things. So the flexibility came in. Uh, the other part is like Nana, you know, I just called colleagues and said, all oh, come to the office. Let's just see each other's face, you know, wear your nose mask, uh, you know, bring your hand sanitizers and all of that. And we found, we found a way of, of funding. Uh, but one thing I also did was to prepare myself for how to lead in this pandemic. And what did I do? I started listening to leaders who have worked within pandemic or, you know, sharing lessons. So each time there's someone on uh, one of these big media networks and they are talking about how they are doing stuff, I listen to them to see what exactly, how are they coping and how are they helping staff. One of the lessons I learned is ensure that once a week, you pick up the phone and call a staff and say, let's just talk, you know, live in general, nothing like work and all of that. And I, I guess I did that fairly well. Again, managing their privacy and ensuring that I'm not intruding. But we just talked and laughed on general things. Uh, before now, I used to be very serious. I don't watch skits, uh, but I started watching skits because I know one of them likes watching skits. So when I talk, I just have, did you see that, that guy, what happened on Twitter? Did they were roasting someone? And you know, we had that, those conversations. And it helped us to um, bond. But I did remember telling them that I don't want you to work beyond five o'clock. Right. And that's why I said clock in nine o'clock and clock out five o'clock. I want to see that. Uh, but I've also stepped that bound when I needed to uh, meet some deadlines. I would have to pick up the phone and call one or two or three of them after five o'clock and say, please. But at that time, I'm actually begging and I'm begging profusely to say, please, I need you to help do X, Y, Z, and this has to go. Um, so it, it's, it's finding that balance and jokingly, when we all resumed at some point, we we're joking and I said to them that, do you want to tell me that you committed all of your time to triple NGO while you were in this pandemic? And they all laughed about it and said, no, it was difficult at times. And I said, yeah, I do understand that it will be difficult, but at least we're all back healthy and better. One other thing we learned also is if you cough in the office now, we joke about it, but we tell you to go on 14 days. So <laughs> we ensure that you don't you don't spread you, you don't spread the virus, and that speaks to having a policy, a health policy that not captures when staff members say, "I have symptoms that looks like I have COVID." All right, can you already let them isolate and ensure that the days they are away, they will still get their full pay, and you know that you also provide a system for supporting them while. Uh, they are self-isolating. So it, it's a tricky part, but also I think employees also should look out for the executive directors also. We're not superhumans. Sometimes we break down. Over to you, Charles. Thank you, Ayubis. <laughs> Excellent. I, I think we need to borrow your cough protocol at Waxy. A lot of us will be on quarantine. <laughs> Thank you for that. I think we would like to now look at opportunities, because uh, I don't think it's all doom and gloom. Right, I think that uh, the COVID has also presented some uh, opportunities. And I remember colleagues talking about, oh, right now we can even look at more intensely at local fundraising, you know, connecting more with our constituencies, um, you know, doing certain programs that we couldn't do before. So I'd just like to get insights from you, Nana. What are some of the opportunities that you have seen that we can take advantage of 
um, and that we can shape the work that we do into the future. Thank you. Definitely technology and the use of technology for our work. I think before we took it, it wasn't that, yeah, it was needed, it was, yeah, but it wasn't really required. Now it is required. And so we have learned a lot. We, and we have learned, it's been a hard lesson, but we have learned a lot how to use technology. And using technology has expanded our reach. It's less costly also, and it has also expanded our reach. The other thing about technology, which is two-sided, is the time management. And so you can have a meeting, and like I was in one meeting yesterday where somebody was saying, physical meeting, typically for many of us, you go for a meeting that's supposed to start at 2. It starts at 2.30 or 3. For the, for the, for the online, 2 o'clock starts at 2 o'clock. And then the time is better is better managed. The downside is that because now we are working, everybody is calling you everywhere. And sometimes you, you might find yourself going for like five meetings in a day. So that puts a lot of pressure. But, but technology definitely, the good sides of it um, is, is one of the things that I believe we've learned. As we've also improved our skill um, in, using, in using it. It's all, it has also provided new ways of working. And so sometimes even collaborations that you have never thought of, groups that you had never thought of engaging, and because of COVID, now many of us are reaching out and connecting, not only in country, but even across the region, globally, there are many discussions, many collaborations that are going on. So that is good. And I believe that it will continue going forward. And one of the major areas is the point about the global South taking its place within international development. And, the, and so that we have a more equal or equitable uh, balance when it comes to working within this development space. And that is definitely one of the areas that I believe after COVID would continue um, to be very strong. For WASI, I've already talked about it several times. We've been able to hold many more of our policy dialogues and even engaged further in different areas of policy influencing and advocacy. Um, it's an opportunity to learn new skills. So as I said earlier, our training and online training um, area is definitely one area that we are learning a lot more um, from and then we have been able to expand to reach our Portuguese speaking colleagues as well. So that is also another opportunity that I can I can talk of. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. Uh, OEB, if you would like to get some insight, some of the things you think are opportunities that you have seen within the environment in which NNGO is working. Um, so I think pre the pre the pandemic, when you send an email to a traditional nonprofit. They probably won't check their emails in one week or two weeks. And, you know, by then, uh, the information you needed has already expired. But we're seeing an increase in real time response on the part of nonprofits to emails these days. That for me is an opportunity, especially given the fact that we had always mentioned that for nonprofits to stay nimble, and for them to be able to drive their mission and vision effectively, they have to rely on technology. Uh, so with tools like Google for nonprofit, uh, with other platforms that would naturally have nonprofit platforms, now is a good time for nonprofits to look at those platforms and explore uh, the nonprofit packages that, um, that comes with the use of those platforms. Uh, the other is how our work uh, the world of work is changing and now we now need to look at working from home. Uh, I did mention at the start of this event that I started my career in this sector working from home. So I've worked uh, out of the 16 or 17 years I have in the sector, I've worked like 12, 13 years from home and it has been very effective and I'm a strong advocate of, we don't necessarily all have to come into office of, or do physical meetings. Um, so COVID happened at the time when I was getting tired of flying. So it's an, also an opportunity for some of us as executive directors to bond with the family, 
now you see your wife and your children and your husband, you see their faces more rather than please bring my back to me at the airport. So it's an opportunity for family bonding also. Plus also more importantly for you to now start thinking about uh, your life and your exit strategy. Meaning that, you know, there's a pandemic, there's a crisis. If I'm able to lead within this crisis, then I should already let someone else take the organization to uh, the next level. So I'm seeing an opportunity for some young individuals to take over uh, the executive directorship of the network. And, you know, they fly with it on a different um, agenda. Another opportunity I see there is now the opportunity that we now need to engage more with our members on one on one basis. Uh, but, for the, but for the pandemic, we would have been doing things generically. But now with the pandemic, we now know many nonprofits might close shops. Uh, some would not even be able to pay salaries. We were actually in that situation. And, you know, th that's why I keep saying that uh, sometimes you don't know what executive directors also go through. As that much, we'd already exhausted our reserves. Um, if you follow the trend of nonprofits very well, your contracts and all of that, don't, you don't get to sign them until April. And the alert gets dropped from June, July, and all of those things. But by March, we exhausted our reserves. And I was already thinking, how would I pay salaries for April? And would I send staffs home? Would I dismantle this very excellent team that I built over two, three years, and which I, I don't want to part with? So I was already racking my brain on how to survive. So we started conversations with donors, and this speaks to issues around also letting you know that I'm not as resource rich as you know you naturally would think. So we started talking to donors, and donors were able to allow us to repurpose some of our grants to cover uh, staff costs. So, but when I look at what we also had, it meant that you know I would also have to cut my own salary because what was allowed for me to repurpose could only cover all of the staff, but my salary won't won't come out from there. So. I'm on 20% salary now, uh, just to tell you what it is. But then it's better than for me to close the office. Uh, why is it better? Is if as Nigerian Network of NGOs, I close the office, then how do I want to support other nonprofits who are lesser than myself and whose mandate I have to be the Nigerian Network of NGOs? So these are some of the sacrifices we've, we've also had to make. Uh, we've also had to cut costs. And we were joking this morning, uh, we couldn't pay vendors that would do uh, the clean of the office. So we do the clean of the office ourselves as all staff. I also join them once in a while to come do it because we don't have that resources, but we have to find a way of living through this pandemic. Uh, so basically, it's also an opportunity for us to bond and for us to learn how to live through a pandemic so that when another pandemic happens, we already have like a toolkit as to how to live. Now I know you can negotiate with your donor and they can be nice enough for you to repurpose. Now I've learned how to be more empathetic. Now I've learned how to cook my food a bit and all of those things. I've also learned to look at what I would eat in the evening, morning, afternoon. You know, <laughs> I've missed the flights. I've missed the cabin crew. Uh, you can now uh, prepare for landing. I've missed a lot of those things. But then within all of that, you see the opportunities that we're still alive and that for once we're able to live through a pandemic and that, you know, we have the leadership role on our shoulders to carry the sector out of, uh, out of what we have now. So that's why I said to myself that yeah, it's good that we have an ED, ED hangout where as executive directors, we just play joke and just go back to, to sleep. And then the following day, we'll go back to all our, uh, all, our, all our issues. And I see someone saying she has missed duty free also. So we missed a lot of things, but there are also opportunities for us to reset relearn and also return over to you charles <laughs> thank you ubc <laughs> i've been controlling my laughter here because you know i can't be a, a nuisance as a moderator but anyway stella please come in <laughs> thank you so much charles uh, we have some interesting comments from our participants as well this time around we'll just read the comments out and charles will carry on with the session and later we'll ask the questions as well so from Olivia Umo, she said, my organization works with three children. While there are a lot of plus in working remotely, we need to acknowledge that there are aspects of our organization services that cannot be done remotely. Our management team resorted to working remotely, but our field staff who accompany children on the street and at our drop-in centers 
they could not carry out follow-up visits and family integration to remote communities. It means that some aspects of our services will still suffer. From Olayinka, Akin Dayomi says, to, to be honest, the COVID-19 and lockdown has, mass, has massive negative impact on the work of NGOs. The use of technology can only go so far. In our environment, data is costly, slow, and disruptive. Our work deals with families who have children with disabilities. Technology has not been very helpful. Uh, this comment also has a question in it that after I read it, our panelists will take up the questions. From Tony Wells, it says, the remote working has some, has some gender challenges. This imposes challenges on women who have to balance domestic work with professional work during lockdown. How do you give more consideration to women without being seen as biased towards other staff? So maybe OABC can take that and Anna can also answer. Um, yes, thank you very much. I, I think I, I, I totally agree. And to the first person that spoke about uh, services, and how people need to go into communities. One thing I would advise is uh, you need to think through how best to do that within a safe, um, within safe and health measures and protocols. But having said that, it's also the advocacy that needs to happen on what essential service also means. Uh, so for our government, essential services, medical doctors, media, hand uh, nurses, or people within the medical field. We now need to start engaging with them. And this is the conversation myself and Nana would have to engage in at the African level and also at the national level. To talk to our government and tell them essential service means that critical services that nonprofits are also you know, providing. Uh, I remember a member of the network whose organization provides support for uh, patients with sickle cell disease. They call them warriors. Their clinics could not open because of the sit at home and uh, other, other measures. But that's an essential service. And you know, if, if warriors would have to move, they don't even have a pass. These are things we need to, conversations we need to bring to government. Uh, they probably might not know or might not have been thinking about that, we need to let them know. The other thing is the advocacy around internet affordability, accessibility, and meaningful connections. Uh, recall that during the pandemic, People were saying 5G brings the COVID and all of that. In fact, you now need the 4G and the 5G for you to be able to have seamless internet connections that can help us all to work from home and including the ability to be able to afford the laptops and the mobile phones, plus also having this internet connection available in public places. So when I get to a school, a library, uh, an hospital, I can have access to meaningful connection in ways that helps me to be able to do to do my work. The other part now speaks also to the last point that has to do with, and I think I've lost my thought on that. That last point has to do with something around, uh, uh, Charles, you want to remind me again? I totally lost that thought. Gender. Gender. Yeah, yeah about gender, about gender. Yeah, I see, fortunately for me, and I'm just saying this lightly, I've, I've always been blessed amongst women and i've enjoyed well, all my bosses in my life have always, always been women uh so i understood that gender dynamics uh fortunately again for me i have more more female colleagues than the male colleagues uh so i do understand how we we need to balance that and also how we need to ensure that uh, we allow them so a colleague was talking to me that um she would have to babysit uh the sister's daughter and I was saying to her that, you know, you can actually bring her to the office. Uh, because for me, I mean, we'll all work. And if you need me to sit with her, I can always sit with her and, and play with her while you're doing the work. I think we, need, we now, as men, um, uh, added organizations, we now need to learn those bits. But also more importantly is to say that we also need to focus attention on what uh, the men folks are, are also facing. Men also have their own uh, issues. So we have to find a balance in terms of, how we ensure that women can do their thing and also men can also do their thing. Men are also pressured, women are also pressured. So we need to... Again, 
it's very it's very it's very tough to lead in a pandemic i must tell you uh, but if you have the right emotional intelligence if you have the right attitude to life uh, you, have, you remain positive and you don't take yourself too seriously i think you would be able to help both the gender dynamics and also to be able to lead the organization very well plus also shadowing other leaders who are also leading at this time learning from their mistakes and also shadowing their good ways of, of, of doing stuff but in terms of the gender dynamics uh, it's a tough one because you also have to balance it as a male uh, person heading an organization. You want to ensure that you're also not uh, so this is my belief and I want to do it. So much as I respect the gender bit, I also would also want you to do your best in ways that ensures that you're not using the gender card, all right? And that uh, where we need to provide the support, the agency support, we are also there to provide that agency support for you to grow. And where we need to step in and ensure that you rise as a female person, we also step in for you to rise. Where we also need for you to rise as a male, we also allow you to rise as a male. We had this honest conversation in my office one day, uh, the male colleagues and the female colleagues. Um, I won't tell you how that ended. Maybe we'll do a webinar on that later. Over to you, Charles. <laughs> Thank you so much for ABC. And Nana, if you could maybe provide some insights on the gender issue. Yeah, from your perspective. Um, it is very real within our context um, that when it comes to care um, in, our, in our homes, particularly where you are home, a lot of the burden falls on women. It shouldn't be so, but that is how it is. And we, we are working and need to work to change that. Um, but that is how it is. They're cooking, they're taking care of their children, they're taking care of their home, in addition to your own work. Um, for many women, not all women, but for many women. And that is how, how it is. And so the point that I think both OABC and myself have made is that you have to be flexible. But in the flexibility, you are looking at being productive. So we have a plan as an organization. We have goals and particular, um, particular ends that we want to meet. And so we work towards that. And, but we are flexible enough because of the person's circumstances for the person to choose their way of delivering on what it is. So you don't determine and you don't micromanage or say, okay, at this time, you, are, you should be at your desk. At this time, you, should, you can't do that in, in a situation like this. But what you can do is to say, okay, by the 20th of July, we need to have this document. And this is the area that you are working on. Please make sure that by the 18th or whatever, you have delivered on your area. Whether you work at it in the morning or you need to sleep in the morning because you have to wake up in the afternoon, you can wake, wake up in the afternoon and do it, or you have to do it at night because everybody is then asleep and you can get some time to do it. You cannot go into that as, as the executive director, but you should be able to trust the staff that they will deliver on what it is that they need to deliver. And that is what you need to be holding them accountable for. How they do it should be left to them because they know their circumstances and how they can work with it and particularly for women it's extremely important because you don't want somebody um being under a lot of stress um taking uh, you know the burden at home all of this and then being also stressed at work because she has to be at her desk when she cannot physically be at her desk you know so those are some of the those are some of the things that that kind of flexibility um, is needed. On all the other points, I think I agree 100% with OABC on engaging governments, on, 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 on supporting, the civil, or supporting civil society, and particularly for some of the services that the public service delivery, and how we complement governments that they should take that into consideration. In this time of COVID, government has been looking at supporting the vulnerable, how are they working with the organizations and supporting them, those that have already been doing that, supporting them so that they can do it. Our governments do not take into consideration support for civil society. 
when they are looking at budgeting or stimulus packages or whatever. It's done in other countries. They don't do it here. But these are some of the things that we have to take into consideration, looking at the services that civil society organizations also deliver. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Nana and OUBC. And so after this, we just want to look quickly at lessons learned. But after that, we'll open up the opportunity for colleagues uh, to, to ask a question. Um, um, but just a quick thing about lessons learned from both you and OUBC. Um, so the, the key word that we've been hearing a lot through this time is resilience. Resilience. I keep on hearing resilience. So from your perspective, what through this experience that we're having right now, what are the things that we need to do as civil society organizations to build resilience for the long term? Uh, if OUBC, you can, you can start, please. Hmm. So building resilience for the sector is a tough one. And the resilience would have to happen at the individual. And it's a collective or a collection of individual resilience uh, strategy that will make a sector resilience. Uh, why am I saying that? Uh, now we need to think through how we engage with government and also need to think through how we provide services to our beneficiaries. Uh, so I was telling a group of nonprofits at a webinar that if in the last two, three, four days or two, three, four weeks, none of your beneficiaries have picked up the phone to call you to say, because you are not here, this X, Y, Z problem is happening, then you're not serving that beneficiary at all. Uh, so you need to think through how are we serving our beneficiary? Are we actually meeting their needs? So you've been meeting their needs pre-COVID. How will you meet their needs now that COVID has added to you know, the needs uh, that they have? Plus also, how are you as an organization able to use your talents, your resources in ways that ensures that uh, you, you are staying small while also making bigger impact. We need to talk now about issues about overhead. For many nonprofits receiving grants, overhead is a big issue. Uh, no donor covers your under, or overhead 100%, except you are a part of the family or something. So we now need to start the bigger conversations around how do we ensure that donors support good uh, salary structure for our sector, plus also how do we ensure that our board also understands that for us to have uh, the likes of XYZ, who would be able to engage and engage better and also attract the right resources for the organization, we need to be able to remunerate them better. So these are conversations that need to happen for us to prepare for the next pandemic. Uh, if organizations will close now, and I know this pandemic affects all sectors, all right? And because it affects all sectors, all of us must come together and work on how best we can stay resilient. And when we say resilience, it means that how do we bounce back? How do we recover quickly? And in recovering quickly, uh, whatever stimulus goes to a small and medium scale enterprise, to the nonprofit sector, if you do pay taxes, much of our uh, uh, funds are tax exempted, but when we pay salaries, we pay tax and we're also contributing to the economy. The volunteer time that also comes with the work that we do helps to drive community and citizens' participation, plus also the services that we're providing communities across the world. All of this has now to be costed, and for us to tell government the impact of our sector so that our government can begin to think of us as a sector, not as a hard-on or troublemakers or uh, people you just have to talk to for you to tick the box, all right? So these conversations, what part, uh, the pandemic has helped us to say is the need to tease out bigger conversations that we've been running away from as a sector. And that now needs to happen for us to be able to build back and re recover quickly. Otherwise, uh, remember that we have a triple crisis. It was first the health crisis, then we moved to an economic crisis and to a social crisis. We need to find solutions for this trip. If nonprofits are missing, then the, pro, the social crisis will stay there for long and we would have a problem of economic and also health crisis because there will be a reverberation for you not making use of non resources to attain whatever recovery you need to build back. So the resilience 
needs to happen with us as civil society leaders also getting comfortable with engaging with government without losing our independence. Honestly, I want to do it. I really don't know, but we have to find a way of doing it because as civil society, we are also, while we have a, a, this beauty in our diversity, there's a part where we also don't coordinate and collaborate effectively. So for instance, if you see OABC hanging with the, the president of the country, you might think I've sold out. Whereas, Maybe I'm just telling the president that Mr. President creates stimulus for non-profits. But everybody thinks he has sold out, especially when you see my cap and I look like a regular politician. So, I mean, these are thinking that we have that us that is also creating a lot of problems for the sector to move. Over to you, Charles. <laughs> Thank you, UBC. Nana, your insights on yeah. the issue of resilience, please. Yeah, and, and it could also create a political crisis, which is the fourth crisis, actually, that we could also, also have. I agree with the points that you have made. Um, and one of the advocacies that, uh, advocacy, uh, that Waxi has been making is for our donors and those who support the sector to look at giving us the kind of support that can strengthen us and, and help us to be able to respond to some of these things. So you are not only supporting with overheads, but you are also looking at how can we support this institution to have reserves to build reserves? How can we support this institution to find ways of diversifying its resources? These are some of the things that the, the, that kind of project-based thinking that many of our donors have, short-term project-based thinking has to change. And so that is one of the key things, working with donors. And then of course the issue about domestic resource mobilization. I think one thing COVID has shown us clearly is that within, we can raise the resources. Um, so how do we build the infrastructure that supports um, providing that kind of support um, to, to civil society to do the work that we do? Not only to support issues around social welfare, which is a lot of it, the humanitarian interventions, which is good and needed, but to also look at the broader issues of social justice, of social accountability, of social protection. So these are some of the things that we would have to look at. Um, but other things, and I think it has to do with within the organization, those are the external. Internally, the organization, as I've said, your people are your greatest assets. We must treat our people well in our institutions. So that is definitely number one. Then the vision and mission of the organization should be owned by every single person in the institution. It doesn't matter what role they are playing within the institution. From ED to gardener to office manager to everybody should understand what the institution has been set up for, who it serves, and what role they have to play in making that happen and own it. So everybody is a leader within their sphere of influence. And I think that is very, very important um, for us to build. We must build and nurture the talents that we have in our organizations and, and, and groom the leaders. We must build an organizational culture of trust because trust is the, is the, is the foundation of every relationship, good relationship. If it doesn't exist, there's no need for you to exist. So that is important. Uh, the organization must prepare for a rainy day. And, and some of us have been living from hand to mouth. And so when this pandemic hit, that was it. You know? And I know it is challenging, but it is a conversation that needs to happen within every organization. And for organizations to look at ways. We must build flexibility into our strategy and our operations. And we must think ahead into the future so that we act today to prepare for that. And I talked about the fact that Waxi had started investing in technology before this happened years ago. So, so I think that is one of the ways and that's one of the things that helped us to be able to ride the storm. We are still in it and it's not easy, but at least it helped us. Um, and we must build our credibility as an institution because at this time, OABC talked about something. Who is asking if you are absent, it shows how relevant you are and how credible you are as an institution. 
So that is important and we must nurture relationships. And it's also very easy for us to lose our focus within this time as an organization. And that is one of the things that I think I would also caution all of us that we must stay focused on our missions and see how we will continue to remain relevant and serve and serve the people for which we have been set up as organizations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nana, and thank you, ABC. We'll give our audience some time to ask questions. You can raise your hand and unmute your and when you are called upon, you unmute yourself to talk. We'll think for time's sake, we'll think about three people. And if you raise your hands first, I mean, it's first come and first serve. So if you raise your hands and you are not caught, please bear with us. It's for time's sake. I will read some question out. Whilst uh, our panelists are answering, you can raise your hand and we'll call you to speak. So from Timothy, he would like to know, he said, I want Nana and OABC to share light on how they deal with physical, emotional, and digital protection while using home as office. <laughs> Maybe Nana would take that. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to understand the physical protection, but, but I guess it's just security, right? So your security, and that would be whether you are working at home or not i think all of us have to find a way of making sure that our homes are secure so that is um, the digital protection though because we are doing a lot of work online we actually have to learn how to make sure that we stay secure online so that is one of the things i think stella mentioned earlier that waxi did run a, a program on that earlier we had a, a webinar on that earlier and the link would be given to you so you can listen to it and also see how you can protect yourself online. And um, I think that is also important. What was the third one? The, there were three. Digital. Um, emotional. 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 Emotional security. <laughs> yes. Actually, we, we, we have to take care of ourselves. But honestly, as executive director, sometimes it's extremely difficult. Um, because there are so many, there are different pressures. So you tend to sometimes forget um, taking care of yourself, um, about taking care of yourself, but it is extremely important. And, and, and one of the things that all of us, especially in this pandemic time, all of us are under one stress, I mean, one pressure or another. Let us make it a point to find a way and, and it can be different ways of, for, for different people of relaxing and, 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 you know, having, I like to laugh a lot. I love, I love, I love laughter. So things that make me laugh, um, I would, I mean, joke, you know, jokes and things like that. Just, you know, release stress, release tension. Um, it's important that we find ways of doing that. So yeah, that, that's an, an, an important point to make. Thank you, Nana. Mr. Ibis, over to you, if you have anything to say on that. Well, I think, I think Nana covered it. For me, for the physical, is just to ensure that I, as much as possible, I still sing, but as much as possible, stay more connected to God uh, and pray to Him all the time. But I still sing, though. Uh, the second part is the, the emotional bit. Uh, so pre-COVID, I don't do exercises that much. But with COVID, I, I take my exercise serious. Uh, plus also now looking for things that will make me laugh. Uh, so I do a lot of skits these days, watch skits. Um, and then I allow, allow, allow children and allow my son to make fun of me. Uh, so I learned how to dance a lot of dance now. I sing a couple of hip-hop Nigerian songs now. And, you know, for me to put that thing on and that, uh, that stress, uh, I try to hang out with friends as much as possible. Uh, I, I try to cook now. Uh, now that I'm home, I try to cook. Uh, it's, it's relieving stress technically, but also it, it, trying to help as much as I can. Uh, so there was a day I packed, uh, I was washing plates and my wife was asking me, yeah, you are washing plates. I'm like, yeah, yeah, no. So can't I wash plates, you know? 
but I was using it to distress and all of those things. And I was also using it to help. So that emotional bit, you have to learn it. Uh, you have to build a very strong emotional intelligence. Otherwise, you'll be a nagging man, a nagging woman at home, and nobody wants to stay with you. Then you, you, then, you then find out that you're just by yourself. Um, in terms of the digital, yes, we have to protect our identity. And in fact, I protected my ATM more. So I kept my ATM where you won't be able to, where you won't be able to see it so that you don't, you don't spend more during this pandemic. So I protected myself digitally. It's just so you should. No, over to you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. So, uh, my colleague Shamri just put into the chat box uh, the link to the web webinars that we had already, the one on digital security. So, you can click on that link and get that on WhatsApp. Someone also on YouTube, so someone also uh, requested that we send it back to them via mail. We'll do that as well. I can see Omola raise hand up. Please, you can unmute yourself and ask your question or comment. Thank you. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Stella. Thank you, uh, Nana and the OABC for the insightful presentations and answers to all the questions that we have asked. Uh, for me, I'm just sitting here and I'm thinking what the post-pandemic era will look like for civil society. And now that some of us have been able to kind of um, find a way to live through this time. And, and what came to mind for me was during the main lockdown, uh, it was clear to me how most governments and uh, uh, the government I'm pretty close to will be Ghana and Nigeria, how they perceive the sector in which we work in. Uh, I think Koyebisi mentioned it, that it was difficult for government to see civil society as essential sector, uh, particularly for colleagues, some of our colleagues whose daily work are done at the you know, grassroots community level. Uh, we were not perceived that way. And we've had these issues of perception for a very long time. And that was also clear in the government's packages for uh, palliatives and uh, no stimulus, as we call it. The sector was not considered. I know most of our government, if not all, do not fund the third sector. But I thought it was an opportunity for them to see that the contribution we were making would require uh, some you know, budget lines. That wasn't done. And uh, when you look at the private sector as well, well, uh, it was business as usual. I know we've spent a lot of time and energy trying to see how we can penetrate and build um, beneficial relationship with the private sector. But I think even us as Waxi, we did make an attempt to speak with some of the telecoms and the feedback was, you know, they were not planned to give more than uh, whatever they had in their budget. So which means the private sector did, not, did also not see our essentiality, you know, as a sector and was unable to help there. It has been business as usual. They've been smiling to the bank. And this uh, brings me to, you know, the thoughts on my mind at the moment. When the times were normal, uh, you know, prior to COVID, one of the issues we have always dealt with as, as a sector is even where we were able to mobilize resources externally or internally, a chunk of these resources goes to flights, you know, uh, uh, hotels and all of that. And we can see a replay of that, uh, uh, do a little bit different even during this pandemic, uh, uh, whereby we have to spend a lot of money on, on uh, internet. So the telecoms are actually smiling to the bank more from the development sector because we have all moved on. Like we've been here and I guess I've been connected since eight o'clock and it's been from one meeting to another. That is a huge uh, sum of money uh, to the private sector, especially to the telecom. So uh, uh, these are different dimensions of the sustainability that we are talking about. And if we move on this way, which is going to be probably for a long time, and as we have been saying that we don't expect the year before to come back. I mean, we, we are not going back. The world has moved even when uh, if the pandemic disappears today, I think there's still going to be the technology world is the future. So it brings me to the question uh, and to Nana and OABC, how can we put certain strategies in place to begin to change our narratives to our government so that we are saying we are not, I mean, we've always been talking about uh, uh, partnership for development and, you know, we're development partners and all of that, but clearly we are not saying that way. 
and, and it was very clear with the way the different sector has treated us uh, at this time. I, I know things changed a little bit when we were able to get together in Ghana and set up that civil society platform for COVID, but there was no action from our government recognizing us as an essential sector that has been contributing to development. So how do we change this narrative uh, post-pandemic or even now that the pandemic is still on? Thank you. Very good question, Lara. Um, evidence is the name of the game. Mm. We have to have the data that shows the contribution that this sector has made to development and positive change in West Africa. Um, many of us do a lot. We don't document it. And we don't, I mean, I know that Waxi is looking at this and, and, and we've discussed it, but we have to work on getting the data that we can show to our governments with the figures that shows the contribution that we make to GDP, the contribution that we make to the creation of jobs in, 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 our, in, our, in our different countries. That is definitely one of the areas that we can, we can work on. The other thing is within the sector itself, we need to coordinate better and we need to collaborate better within the sector. Because when you are able to do that, you can then present a strong voice and position that government cannot but listen to. So that's in addition to connecting with, so I'm talking about NGOs, but not only NGOs, I'm looking at civil society sector as a whole. So we are working with professional associations, we are working with voluntary associations, we are working with faith-based organizations, social movements. How do we coordinate the work that we do in a way that presents a very strong position? I think that is definitely another area. And we also have to look at how we can work more with the communities that we serve. Because the question that, 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 that and, and, and in a way we have responded, we have mentioned this. If today your organization closes down, who will stand up or who will feel it? Who will stand up to say, we need this organization here? What is the relevance? And, and who are our supporters? Who are those people who are ready to invest in the work that we do? The connection between the communities, the citizens, and the different civil society organizations must be stronger than it is. And we have to invest in building that kind of connection. So for me, those will be the things. But as I said, evidence is the name of the game. We have to provide the evidence. Otherwise, government doesn't see us if we cannot show what it is that we are doing. Yeah, thanks. And I mean, just to add to that, Nana, is to say that, yes, I totally agree with you on the evidence being the game. And also, uh, I think two, three years before now, we started doing something on the economic impact of non-profits, where we designed a methodology for us to capture data on what non-profits are spending and uh, their source of their revenue and all of those things. But again, data is a big trouble, like you did say. Uh, many non-profits don't keep record of their activities and sometimes they tell you, why should I? I'm the one funding my organization, why should I? All of this, that's why when I was talking about resilience, I did say that the resilience of the sector is determined by that, that collectivity of individual organizations doing what is right within their small cubicle and that translates into a bigger picture of what the sector looks like. And I'll give you a very quick example around the issue of evidence. So while we were doing, we we're writing a civil society statement uh, for the high-level political forum, and civil society organizations were saying government hasn't done anything on the SDGs, they haven't done well. And I said to myself, we have been tracking what government has been doing in the last three, four years on the SDGs. They've actually done a lot. But what is missing is you and I are not tracking them. Plus, when we even track them, we're not able to tease them and sit, situate them within the SDGs agenda itself. Plus, also, we, we are happy to excuse our inability 
to think critically, analytically, and with an open mind. Uh, this is not to say I'm speaking for government, but it's to say that we need to be able to identify gaps, all right? So uh, this is the Nigeria Economic Sustainability Plan. We can develop by government within COVID for us to build back better. And in this plan, there's a lot of activities that government has mapped out. They, they sync so well with policy areas that we are thinking as Nigerian Network of NGOs government should be working on. Now government is saying they want to implement this. I think we should also not wait for government many times to talk to us. We should also go to government. But the politics then comes. When Nigerian Network of NGOs, for instance, goes to government and start talking, then you find some people saying Nigerian Network of NGOs is not representative and is not talking to us. Whereas the Nigerian Network of NGOs is talking about bigger issues that affect the whole sector. So we ourselves sometimes are our own enemies and government would not listen to us when we don't have like a common platform or a working group where they can talk to all of us and we can all disseminate that information to an agenda. The private sector doesn't also see us as serious because again, we've refused to go to the private sector with the right evidence. We all most times go with sentiments. Uh, we've not provided them with evidence. And that narrative changed for us as Nigerian Network of NGOs as an organization when I paid deliberate effort, when I paid deliberate effort into ensuring that when I go to any private sector organization, I go with evidence and I'm able to sit at the same level and at the same level of thinking as their director. So my thinking has to be like that of their final boss, who the supreme boss. That's how my thinking has to be. So I don't want to lead an organization where when I'm talking, I'm talking like someone that is not, you know, I, I can articulate myself very well, speak on the issues, address the issues, provide solutions, and tell what the next steps will be in terms of how best to address it. I think we need this level of uh, thinking within the sector also. And we must start that by, by attracting the right set of people. When you look at the nonprofit sector, the they will tell you I'm just managing some you know, they, they are not always proud of working in the nonprofit sector. Why? Because the way the sector itself is. So we need to do a lot of house cleaning for us, for government to take us serious and for us to take ourselves serious. I hope that answers your question, Omola. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nana and ABC. I know we have many questions in the chat box. Some of the questions we haven't read them out because when our panelists are talking, they have touched on that, or some other participants have already asked them. That's why we haven't read all out. So we'll take Bear and then we'll come to a, an end because of time, please. Bear, so if you can listen to me, unmute yourself. Thank you. Hello. Yes, am I in? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, most of the things that I want to rest uh, were already rest by uh, previous uh, participants. Like, uh, like it has been said, uh, there is a pandemic that uh, we are all facing as the conference are uh, just uh, too much. Uh, compared to us uh, in the Gambia here, I think our issue is a bit bigger than all the challenges that people were mentioning from different countries. Uh, looking at us currently, uh, electricity is a problem. Electricity is a major problem here. And whereas, you know, you go to certain communities, especially where we do our programs, you go to the communities, they don't even have electricity. So these are some of the constraints that we are we, we having. So that's why of recently, uh, most of the programs that we are implementing have been changed to most of them to our radio program, especially the community radio programs that we are targeting. Because it's a very big issue, uh, whereas, you know, you want to, like, let's say, it's not, it's not, it's not even possible to have an online meeting with the people in those communities. You know, most of them, you go to them, you want to talk about some of these issues. They will say, come on, for us, we don't even have clean drinking water. You know what I mean? These are major constraints that we are facing as a country. I think this is something that uh, we, uh, we are all faced with. But I think with time and with your guardian, at least you have been into the issue for so long and then you are well experienced on, on some of these issues. I think it is great to learn from uh, some of the things that, uh, you know, you are talking about. Just uh, when the director mentioned, whereas 
uh, he was said, you know, I, I, I learned how to clean. Sometimes I would join my people to clean the office. My boss just walked in from his office and just came to my office and looked at me to my office and said, do you hear what the guy was, do you hear what director was said? I was there, I laughed. I said, <laughs> so uh, we've learned a lot and I think as organizations, uh, we will adjust to it to meet the challenges and then to mitigate them. So thank you very much and it's great to be in the platform. Thank you so much, Ba. Thank you so much, Nana. Thank you so much for UBC. Just for us to conclude, we just want, you know, a, a, a concluding message for colleagues on this call, for the broader civil society players who want to remain resilient, who want to thrive, who want to be effective, even though we are facing a major disruption. What would be that message you think we need to hear? Maybe we'll start with you or UBC. Um, I think the message we would have to hear is one, um, the issues that we had pre-COVID would always be with us. Uh, so we shouldn't let all of that worry us. Uh, as I speak to you, I don't know whether I'm running on generator or something. And UK is not taking electricity, hasn't been with us for long. Uh, I power my own uh, water into my house and into this office. Uh, so the issues are there. But I think rather than letting those issues weigh us down, we must find a way of ensuring that uh, we stay on top of our game, uh, learn all the things you need to learn, relearn, uh, have an open mind, uh, build emotional intelligence, uh, don't see yourself as the boss or, or the servant, uh, do what needs to be done to get the work done. Uh, drive yourself. I always tell people, I tell my colleagues, I said, if you fill your timesheet very well, in two, three years, where you need to update your CV, you just go back to that timesheet and pick everything you've done and put on that CV, and then your CV will look good. So if you don't feel your time sheet very well, you're not killing me as an organization, you're killing yourself. Do the work, work doesn't kill. After all, the Bible told us that we'll hit uh, from uh, our sweat. So do the work, and if you see a boss that is driving you, drive yourself along with the boss. I wish you all the best. Thank you so much, UBC. Thank you so much for those words. Nana? Yeah, um, these are difficult times. They are challenging times, but they also have an uncanny way of helping us to become more focused and finding what can help us to succeed. So let's take advantage of that. Let's be creative in our adaptation to this new pace. I like what the colleague from the Gambia talked about, that for them, they don't have electricity, so they are using the radio. Let's be creative in our adaptation. What is it that you can use within your context? for you to continue to provide the, the service that you provide and, 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 and the support that you provide. For WAXI, we will continue for as long as it remains to, 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 you know, to work to ensure that civil society in whatever form it takes, we continue to positively impact the development of our sub-region and that civil society is also strong enough to do that. So for me, I pray that everybody stays safe within this time, um, it's very important. But let us also not take our eyes off the ball because the things that we were advocating for and working for or towards before the pandemic still exists. Inequality is exacerbating in a way that post COVID is going to be even worse. So the problems we were dealing with before might actually become worse post COVID. So let's not keep take our eyes off the ball. Let's look at that but the thing is that there have been pandemics in the world before they have come and they have gone this one too shall pass but let's work to ensure that we come out of it stronger we may even look different because you may even have to look at the way you are structured to, to change the, the structure of your organization but let's come out stronger and be more useful um, for the people that we serve so all the best to everybody. And um, I know that we will come out strong. We will. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nana. Thank you, ABC, for your time, your precious time. And to colleagues who are on the call, who have joined us, we know that we have passed time. But thank you for, for staying with us till the end. And as Nana mentioned, Waxi, has uh, is working on giving sub highly subsidized uh, technology for organizations. So when we are sending 
you the recordings of this session. We'll also add a link to that as well so that you can register and benefit from this program. And to uh, colleagues who are also part of the tech support, COVID-19 Vilgans and tech support program, we have acknowledged your, your presence and thank you so much for joining us. And to my co-moderator, Charles, you have done extremely well. Thank you so much. And thank you to you all who have uh, other um, webinars under this series. And we know that anytime you see the call, you register and represent. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.